Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the organizers first for allowing me the honor and the privilege of speaking to you all at this conference on this hot and very important topic of, converse, of, uh, of competitiveness. In English, the word compet competition is rooted in the concept of rivalry, in chasing a particular goal or objective or competing against another entity in a kind of gladiatorial battle. I think this gladiatorial battle concept is entirely appropriate here because it's what competition and competitiveness is all about. Competitiveness is, of course, about our own ability to win those particular battles. The business world has always been about having strong elements of competition. But today, with the advent of globalization, it's a fiercer than ever, and we are, in essence, engaged in a gigantic Darwinian struggle. And here's the hard part. The winner gets to have your job, your wages, and maybe your livelihood too. It's a battle for the survival of the fittest in the most comprehensive way possible. The face of competition continues to change dramatically. Companies that once we once discounted are now strong, and the ones we revered once are now fallen and flowered. Regions we once thought were weak are now strong, and just look for a moment at the immense capability of the company Huawei in telecommunications today. Yet only 20 years ago, we'd all have discounted them as any kind of serious company. Huahu, we might have said, yet today they're a magnificent company of immense capability. Similarly, Kodak uh, announced bankruptcy last week, yet 20 years ago, nobody would have imagined such a thing. I would have considered them as, as a Dow 30 component in the United States, one of the very best companies in the world. There's a long list of other companies, once great and once competitive, who no longer exist, who are now shadows of their former self, and this can happen to any company unless it remains competitive. Competitiveness is neither static either. It's kind of like a roving hunter looking for places to bludgeon the next easy prey, trading on and exploiting your weaknesses, your blind side, playing arbitrage with labor rates and taxes or cheap local sources of supply. What gives you an advantage today, say in costs or taxes, may not be there tomorrow. You must have the ability and the will to be able to change and adapt if you're to survive in this business, let alone succeed. You have to be prepared to endure a nomadic journey from one competitive manufacturing location to another as the tidal flows of competitiveness move around the world, sometimes even back over the old ground that was once scorched. Darwinian principles have a lot to teach us about being competitive. Fundamentally, a company loses competitiveness when it changes more slowly or adapts more poorly than the external environment does. Even small differences in competitiveness can ultimately leave a once vibrant company stranded and in danger. There are no silver medals awarded for second place in sometimes a winner-takes-all competitive game. For example, look at the cell phone business. The king today can so easily be the surf tomorrow. Worlds are turned upside down in two or three years. An unassailable position today is an unavailable position tomorrow. So by implication, to remain competitive, you must adapt and change. Shall we say innovate in all senses of the word, faster than the competition in the external environment. History and nature teaches that there is no one perfect animal and by implication, no one perfect company in the world. Different competitive models can work effectively depending on the environment and the type of competitive challenge that a company faces. In our company, we have very many of these. Sometimes the model, either an animal or a company, requires speed alone. Sometimes it requires size, in other words, scale, shall we say. Sometimes it's height. Sometimes it's camouflage. But one thing always remains, requires, is brains and the ability to adapt to local circumstances. The company with the most brains will almost always win the battle, all other things being equal, and that means the need to hire 
and inspire great people. Some might consider having to change so quickly risky. But my view, being a company changing faster than the external environment is actually far better than the alternative, even if you get some of it wrong. This is because you are creating the environment others have to compete with. There are many versions of the future. Many can be invented yet. And it's far better that the future can, being created is your version of the future, not somebody else's. You are the leader and they are the follower. They have to decide if the direction you've chosen is the right one, as well as to compete with your speed and your already established lead. Or maybe they need to consider to compete with your, uh, 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 or maybe they need to consider whether they can come up with a better product or a better strategy to try and overtake you in the relentless game of competitive leapfrog. Innovation is undoubtedly the most important tool in competitive dynamics. It levels the playing field. It can make small companies punch above their weight with disruptive technology and can dislocate markets, products, and consumers in the seeming blink of an eye. It can cause large companies to appear lumbering and slow. It's a word that's way overused these days, I know, but it's what all companies, I think, should aspire to be. I love the quotation from George Bernard Shaw who said, the people who get on in this world are the people who go out and look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. They are the innovators. The implicit point hidden in Shaw's quotation is that the best way to forecast the future is actually to create it. And he's right. You can only do that if you're an innovative company. If you're not, the chances to compete effectively in the world are all the harder and maybe even impossible. But even innovation or speed alone is not enough. There are numerous other factors which determine your long-term competitiveness and chances of success. I'll speak about this topic of competitive platforms in just a couple of minutes. A company must always be thinking about two things in parallel, relentless incremental improvements, but also the leapfrog, the disruptor, if you like. If you aren't thinking about how to leapfrog the competition and jump ahead, you're probably the one who's going to get leapfrogged, I'm afraid. But in my world, the world that I live in, there is nothing quite so demoralizing to a competitor as you beating them to the market fast with a new breakthrough idea at a low cost, but then to have a veritable river of new products streaming out into the market, beating out the competition at every single turn. Innovation, of course, is risky. About 12 years ago, I just had made a, uh, been made CEO of Brunswick and was hosting a question and answer session after a speech I gave. My predecessor had spent a lot of money in the company on training and development, and someone in the audience asked me the question. They said, George, if we continue to pay for all this training and development and people leave the company, what are we going to do? My answer was, what if we don't and they stay? The same principle tr is true here for innovation. Innovation may well be risky, but if you don't innovate, you can never win the competitive battle, no matter how hard you try and no matter what the risks are in innovating. You must innovate to survive, let alone to prosper. That is, and always has been, 3M's secret deadly weapon. The kernel of successful innovation is to hire the right people, inspire them and give them a dream and the resources to get the job done. Then stand back and let them get on with it. Pay attention to their progress like an attentive parent, but only help them when things look like they might fail. At 3M, innovation is a self-organizing cultural phenomena. It's part of our DNA learned over many years, but there is much more that can be replicated by your own company, your companies, and much more I could say about it. Inventions and technology are not owned by one division in 3M, but a communal property, and everybody in the company shares them freely. So the question remains, how do we actually manage this? Innovation and creativity can only flourish in an atmosphere of relative freedom. I don't mean laissez-faire 
or anarchy, but constructive freedom with interesting guidance of great employees by enlightened management. As part of this, that we give our R&D employees 15% free time to work on their own ideas, not company ideas, their own ideas. Innovation, particularly the invention part of it, cannot be reduced to a process, which many people really want, uh, with a, a, a process something like Six Sigma. Innovation is non-linear, it's stochastic, and it's also discontinuous. If you get behind in creativity, you can't use Six Sigma tools to schedule yourself for two good ideas on Wednesday and three on Friday. It won't work. You need to use some sort of magic dust that you can sort of sprinkle on the process and have some faith. And the 15% I spoke about is part of that. Do this, and in most, case, uh, most cases, good employees will respond to you. Another myth is that competitiveness is born in the voice of the customer. Sorry, it isn't. It requires that factor, yes, but it requires much, much more. Customers often don't really know what they want or might please them uh, more. Henry Ford, you know, said that uh, if he'd only listened to his customers, what they wanted actually was a faster horse that ate less hay, and we all know where that one went. Apple also proved that at the same point in spades, which one of us would have described Apple's products as our needs in a voice of the customer survey before they came out. There is no data on the future. Inspiration is really what we need. The two great qualities of innovation and innovative companies are optimism and curiosity. You cannot create or innovate without being an optimist. And a natural bedfellow of optimism is risk. They go together. There is no basis for optimism if there is no risk. And the other key uh, factor in innovation is curiosity. You'll never see that new idea, that new breakthrough, without having curiosity as a key, and of course, the brains to recognize that something you see is new and important. A kind of Maslow hierarchy also prevails. Few companies remain competitive without having the incentive of a driving hunger to push them along. Competition spurs better performance. You need an identified target, an enemy, if you will, even a virtual one that you want to defeat. Monopolies, are no natural, monopolies have no natural enemies and so rarely remain competitive in any sense over long periods. Unless the leadership of, of a monopoly company is very careful to set artificial hurdles, the incentive to change, to adapt, to improve, dies out. The same is true for government-owned entities. They're rarely competitive. Good competition is nearly always good for business, and no competition is usually bad for customers. I once read, you know, that companies are a little bit like chickens. They benefit from having to scratch around a little bit for what they have to eat. While innovation is the essential key to success, it must rest on a platform of operational excellence. It's not sufficient alone. We think there are six competitive platforms which industrial manufacturers like to use, though I think that they're more broadly applicable than just industrial and probably more widely applicable than just manufacturing. The first and possibly the most widely uh, uh, important cost, uh, platform is cost. It is the ultimate competitive deadly weapon. If you could only compete on one platform, this would be the one to use. The second platform is technology. It is the maker of dreams and the creator of differentiation and ultimately the source of innovation. I'm reminded here of Arthur C. Clarke's quotation that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 3M is firmly and squarely in the business of technological magic. The third platform is customer service. The fourth is brands and marketing. The fifth is distribution. And the sixth is people. In some consumer businesses, there is a seventh, which is great design. Our traditional way of doing business for many years was by creating entirely new markets and competing only at the top of the pyramid. And it worked well, but ultimately it cost us a lot of value-creating growth. For example, three members invented the heart-lung machine, cochlear implants, 
knee and hip replacements, the entire industrial and office tape business, magnetic tape for recording, digital video players, post-it notes, electronic printers, fax machines, nano restoratives for dental and many other product, uh, businesses I could, manage, uh, I could mention. Three invented, would you know, 32 different businesses which are no longer uh, in our portfolio. In half of the cases, we simply refuse to compete at lower margins in our market-creating patents. As our market-creating creating patents expired, products commoditized and new competition entered the market. So we're gradually pushed out of many of those businesses by lower margin competitors. In other cases, the technology went end of life. Had we not had the ability to constantly invent, reinvent new businesses or new technologies, our company would have been long dead. New markets such as the ones often created by 3M are almost always created at the bottom, where they commoditize the volume expense at the, top, at the bottom. New competitors almost always enter at the bottom of the market, and both often it's Asian, and nearly always they use the weapon of price, or shall we say cost, to compete. So about six years ago, we realized that, in really a strange twist of irony, <clears throat> that if we wanted to be good at the top, we had to be good at the bottom also. And we've used our creative and innovative powers to do it, and it's been hugely successful. Ultimately, end customers, uh, customers have benefited from this move. So to defend against it, by the time cheap competition enters the market, you better already be there with the right product and the right cost basis and have learned how to do it well. It's especially important at times like these. In regulated markets like healthcare, new competition usually comes from existing participants in the market, and it nearly always comes at the top of the pyramid and it's almost always based on new technology. But again here, over time, top products kind of trickle down the market like melting ice, and cost must always be a factor when you consider learning how to compete in that segment. So this pyramid strategy <coughs> is always another, is another very powerful combined offensive and defensive measure. But it isn't as easy to do well as you might think. It requires very careful management of the brands, of costs, and choosing the right level of technology appropriate to the position in the marketplace. It requires you to innovate and grow it all the way down the pyramid, bringing an appropriate level of technology and value creation all the way down. A burning question for many mature companies is, how do I compete against, say, tough Asian competition? Whether we like it or not, for the most part, they're smaller, more nimble, more energetic companies than we are. The people they employ work harder, they're more hungry, and they're sometimes, though not always, more creative, simply because they have to do that to survive. It's certainly not a bed of roses for small companies either. They're a natural part of the Darwinian experimentation I spoke about earlier. You know, all large companies began as small companies, and though many will fail along the way, some of those companies are the future multinationals of the world, and they are very definitely your target competition. And if you don't handle it right, one day they may be standing on your figurative grave. In fact, they may have dug that grave for you. Worse than that, if you're not competitive, you may have dug it yourself. So no matter what else you do, there is never any substitute for hardworking competition. If I was to show you two identical companies, two absolutely identical companies, where one of its people worked 40 hours a week and the other worked 60 hours a week, <clears throat> I'll show you the winner of that battle every single time. Now, some people may think all sorts of unpleasant social implications that this has, and that may well be the case, but that, of course, is not our topic today. But the essence of the message here is that to compete with a great Chinese or Indian company you must be like them in all respects, while never compromising your ethics. Be in China, in India, commit to it, develop products locally, and people locally. It will ultimately serve you well. You cannot compete with a competitor at a long distance 
and you will never beat them until you learn to mimic their strengths. There is a myth that to, to defeat a competitor, you must attack him where he's strong. Uh, weak, weak, forgive me, but I disagree with that. There is a short history lesson here on what I've come to call Hannibal's Paradox. In the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage, neither side gained permanent advantage. Carthage had a great navy and Rome a great land army, and each sometimes won and each sometimes lost. But what Hannibal, the leader of the Carthaginian army, realized is that is to ultimately defeat the Romans. If you want to defeat the Romans, he had to do it in Rome. And the same is true in business. If you want to defeat a competitor, ultimately you will have to face them where they're strong, not just where they're weak. In this way, using the ideas I've spoken about today, and many others I didn't have time to cover, we found it possible to create what we call enduring franchises, markets where you hold the category-defining brand and huge customer loyalty. Having said all of this that I said this morning, the fight to be competitive is never over. You can never relax and you can never become complacent. As my hero from history, Winston Churchill, once said, the end is only the beginning of what comes next. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.